So for this first talk, we are really glad to have uh, Kieran Hines. So Kieran, if you can join us, who will tell us about the European third-party platforms landscape and what we can learn from it, and what does it say is about shaping the future of of the of the landscape? Yeah, hello, Kieran. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you really well. I invite you to share your your, your slides. There we go. That so should be working. So yes, uh, so far, yes, the European TPP landscape. Perfect, charting the progress of open banking. We're good. Uh, I let you uh, with the audience and you have uh, 25 minutes uh, on the stage with us. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much. Well, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, so my name's uh, Kieran Hines and I'm a senior analyst in the banking team at uh, Solent. Uh, for uh, those who are not familiar with us, uh, we're an ind independent uh, analyst, research and advisory firm that supports uh, financial institutions when it comes to their decisions around technology. And so obviously open banking uh, is an area that we've been heavily involved in over, over recent years. Uh, now, what I'll be doing over the next 20 minutes or so is sharing uh, some of the highlights from our recent research into the TPP ecosystem uh, in Europe. Um, and the perspective throughout all this is to understand um, what's happening now so that we can then project forwards and think around where this is taking uh, not just uh, the, the nature of um, open banking enabled innovation, but also, of course, what that means for uh, the wider industry. Um, now, I can only share snippets, of course, in the time we have, and I would, of course, welcome uh, any opportunity to continue the conversation with, uh, with people if they would like to after the event. And so uh, to start, I guess it probably makes sense to uh, explain why we've, we've looked at the TPP ecosystem. And, and what we've done is to uh, very uh, earlier on this year, we, I suppose you could say we invested our lockdown. Uh, in doing a very thorough uh, categorization and classification of every single one of the TPPs licensed under a national competent authority under PSD2. Uh, and the reason we did this was quite simple. Uh, I think um, we've been involved in a lot of client conversations asking about open banking. So, you know, is it still happening? What's going on? What do I need to know? Uh, and that sort of thing. And so, um, from our perspective, we wanted to think of ways in which we could sort of reliably look to understand uh, not just where open banking is and where it's going, but also to get a view on kind of the health or the effectiveness, if you like, of uh, open banking initiatives. Um, and so from, from our perspective, uh, we view the emergence of TPPs as one of the most significant outcomes, I think, of all the various open banking initiatives underway. Um, the reason for this being a simple one, which is that uh, every single TPP is not just a line of spreadsheets, uh, it's a business. Uh, it's, it's a company, it's got founders, got investors in some cases, um, all of whom believe that uh, through leveraging uh, open banking APIs, they can create propositions for customers which are in some way you know, profitable and address customer needs. Um, and so with that in mind, um, what I want to do in this session is to cover two themes, really. Uh, the first is to look at the demographics of the TPP population uh, to see what this kind of tells us around where urban banking is today. Uh, and then the second is to look more closely at some of the emerging themes when it comes to the value propositions being offered today uh, using open banking APIs uh, aimed at consumers. Um, for what it's worth, I'm currently doing the, the same analysis on the B2B segments, but so that wasn't ready in time to uh, present this to you today. But uh, hey, maybe next year. Um, right. So uh, the first thing I want to do is to look at uh, the overall sort of size of the TPP population. Um, now, as I'm sure you know, and, and I guess contrary to a few of the expectations around the industry three, four years ago, um, there has been no sort of big bang of TPP registrations, um, despite the, um, the, the, the confidence with which that was predicted by, by some commentators. Uh, what we've seen uh, more sensibly, I think, is a period of uh, steady growth in the number of TPP uh, registrations uh, across Europe, which is roughly increased by, on average, 25 to 30 uh, new TPP licensed entities um, every quarter since the beginning of uh, 2018. And so, as you can see here, uh, by the end of uh, quarter two, so end of June, there were 334 
uh, TPPs by our count, uh, licensed by National Competent Authority, and that was up by 44 uh, um, on the end of quarter one. Uh, I think you know, and it's kind of remarkable in some ways, of course, given that uh, most of Europe was in some form of lockdown uh, through that period. Um, and that figure, though, end of Q2 was up uh, 86% on, on the uh, same point in 2019. So again, sort of steady, steady growth, um, albeit from a, a fairly small base. Also worth noting that um, this that when we talk about TPPs, these aren't just uh, you know groups of students tinkering with APIs in a hackathon or anything like that. These are uh, in the main uh, trading businesses. So um, when we did the, a deeper pass at this back in Q1, uh, 260 of those 290 TPPs registered at the time were the live businesses offering services to customers. Not all using uh, PSD2 APIs, I should add, but nevertheless, these were you know, actual trading companies. Um, so set the context there. Um, the next thing I want to look at is sort of what we see in terms of the, the distribution of these providers and um, fairly clear and again, probably few surprises to see that uh, the distribution at country level is, is quite uneven and almost half of the TPPs in Europe are licensed by the, the FSA uh, in the UK. Um, Probably a few surprises here, I think, given the uh, UK's domestic open banking initiative, which predated the effect of go lives for uh, PSD2. I think also London, of course, has always been a, uh, a solid fintech hub, which I think has also played a role. Um, but it's important to note that the rest of Europe is, is catching up, of course. Uh, and the, uh, the share of um, non-UK licensed TVPs, if you like, has grown quite steadily from uh, around a third in early 2018 to just under half now. Uh, Germany, Sweden, France, and the Netherlands make up the, the biggest um, markets in, in that regard. Now, of course, you know, I think um, having uh, enjoyed so much of the conference over the last uh, best part of two days and heard some uh, great presentations from uh, uh, representatives of banks in Europe, it's clear that um, a lot of this is being driven by the activity of individual financial institutions, as well, of course, I think, as you know, the fact that PSD2 is live and some of the uh, initial issues around uh, standards and, and uh, the customer experience are, are gradually being uh, addressed. So an area that will continue to, to evolve, I think. Um, now, I think uh, the next thing I want to do is look at the types of companies uh, licensed under um, PSD2. And uh, one important thing to note here is that um, uh, TBPs are not all startups. Um, indeed, around 35%, so over one in three, are companies that have been trading for 10 years or more. Um, you know, so a length of time that predates even the earliest conversations around open banking. And many of those organizations have been trading for, for many more years. Um, and then uh, kind of uh, at the other end of that scale, around 60% nevertheless are um, uh, companies which have been founded within the last decade. Uh, and many of those actually are quite young organizations. Uh, now, why is that important? Um, uh, I think while there are many exciting startups and young businesses doing clever things with um, PSD2 APIs, um, I think what's intriguing, certainly from a competitive perspective, is, is the fact that uh, you think about that 35%, uh, many of those are uh, well-established large companies with products, with customer bases, with brands, and in lots of cases, uh, resources as well. Uh, and so when you think about, uh, again, where the nature of competition may come from, what might spur innovation, uh, we could well see some uh, interesting moves coming from, from that part of the space. Now, on the bottom of that slide, uh, you can see the, uh, the business areas that um, those companies fall into. Uh, and as you can see, uh, just under half of those TPPs have been around for 10 years or more, fall into that bracket of uh, payment processing, uh, accounting platform providers such as Sage or Xero, uh, and then um, software vendors, uh, prominent in that group. And I think that does begin to point to you know, some of the areas where we may see some accelerated competition if uh, players in that space uh, begin to start making some moves. Um, the next thing I want to look at is the customer targeting. Um, and so um, I think it's important to note and, and flag here that open banking 
uh, at least in Europe, has become about far more than innovation to the retail customer. Uh, kind of proving the law of unintended consequences, of course, because you know, PSD2 was initially uh, designed to improve competition and, and uh, address regulatory gaps in the, the retail market. Um, so we've, what we've done here is to break down the, um, the value propositions of all of those TPPs in Europe to look at uh, who they primarily look to, to serve. Now, this isn't based strictly on uh, offerings powered by PSD2 APIs, but nevertheless, uh, I think does kind of reflect looking at the uh, the customer base that the these TPPs are targeting. That I think obviously then correlates with how they may wish to use uh, open banking APIs in, in the future. Uh, and so, as we can see, um, the uh, sole traders offerings aimed at sole traders, SMEs, and mid market corporates are by far the biggest segments, uh, accounting for around three quarters of all uh, TPPs compared to uh, 40% that have a, a direct-to-consumer offering. Um, now, a couple of things that are important here to also flag is that the momentum is very much behind B2B. Uh, if you look back at where the, uh, the landscape was in 2018 versus 2019 and where we are now, there's definitely been a pivot towards uh, B2B innovations, and that's uh, clearly an interesting shift. I mean, the other point is from a bank perspective, I guess, this just reinforces that perspective that um, when it comes to the, the nature of the competitive challenge from the party providers under open banking, then this is about attacking different product propositions, niche customer bases, and so on. And I think that's a very, very important uh, challenge that the industry has to address in, in terms of its certain response. And then the, the final thing in this section I wanted to look at was kind of uh, some thoughts around how open banking APIs are being used in practice, um, particularly with reference to um, uh, new products and services. And so what we've done here, uh, so each TBP, uh, or at least each TBP's offerings have been judged against a four-point scale based on the, uh, the relative importance of open banking APIs to the overall product offering. So um, a bit of a subjective measure, but nevertheless, we wanted to understand or get a sense of the degree to which uh, open APIs, open bank APIs are being used at the moment uh, in, uh, in live services. And so four categories. Uh, the first is, is high, which means that the value proposition is almost entirely reliant on VAT2 APIs. Uh, so a good example here would be a provider of multi-banking or uh, account aggregation services. So no APIs, no service. Uh, the next group, uh, medium, uh, and so these are value propositions that are considerably enhanced by uh, PSD2 APIs, but, but could nevertheless continue uh, without them. And so uh, a lending marketplace, for example, or a 2PP acting as a broker that uses uh, so an AISP API to improve its uh, customer onboarding or account or application process, uh, perhaps uh, would fit in that category. Um, the next grouping is low, uh, so those that play only a minor role in the overall product offering, such as online accounting services, so that the core value proposition being the accounting and, and the reporting services rather than the, uh, the role of the uh, AISP API. Uh, and then the fourth area is uh, whether there are no clear signs of the PSD2 APIs being used at all. Um, so, uh, with that in mind, I think some findings to draw from this. Um, I think the first is that around a quarter of TPPs currently make no obvious use of uh, open banking APIs, um, which I guess speaks both to, um, well, certainly I think in my perspective, suggests there is a, a whole pool of providers out there um, that may come on stream quite soon with, with new services, and clearly this is a, a potential driver of change in the marketplace. Uh, the second, I think, is, is almost more interesting, which is that we've seen a bit of a shift in the way in which um, uh, particularly transaction data uh, is being used in TPP propositions. You can't see it all from this chart, but I think um, from some of the other work we've done, it's quite clear that the proportion of services that rely entirely on um, particularly uh, account information APIs uh, is decreasing slightly in, in favour of um, those providers that are using transaction data in particular to add value uh, to another uh, workflow or another uh, proposition. And I think this is where we're beginning to see kind of almost a, a second wave of innovation and, and new ideas come through from the TPP segment. 
So the uh, next thing I wanted to do was just to um, provide some thoughts on where we see innovation and what the themes are in terms of uh, TPP propositions in the B2C space. Uh, and again, this is based on that, that same um, research project we conducted earlier in the year. Uh, so the um, the headline, uh, I think, uh, headline finding here is that there are um, uh, 15 specific products propositions, or you can group all the, the, the B2C offerings in the marketplace into 15 categories, uh, which ultimately address um, five uh, customer pain points. Uh, and this is uh, some of the research that we've been positioning to our bank customers. Um, and, and to do two things, really, one, two, to highlight um, where there are uh, you know, competitive challenges in the marketplace, um, although we put it rather bluntly, so, you know, these are examples of propositions where third parties are using uh, data from your customers to uh, sell new services to your customers. Um, and so there's certainly a, a perspective there. I mean, this is also, I think, again, um, analysis that we, we use to uh, uh, suggest to our customers whether they should be thinking about you know, partnership or or new uh, innovation opportunities in the, particularly the digital channels. And so um, there are so 15 individual uh, propositions across five uh, specific sort of problem statements or areas. Uh, and so uh, going from left to right, um, the first one of these is what we call aggregation and visualization. So uh, you know, help me understand my financial position, I guess being the, uh, the customer need being solved there. Uh, and this is mainly things like multi-banking and PFM interfaces. Uh, the next grouping is uh, assistance and support. So tools or interfaces to help customers better budget or build deposits and things. And so things like savings goals um, and support with managing subscriptions uh, sit in here. Uh, the third category is uh, what we call financial benefits. So uh, and this is where things begin to get a bit more interesting as uh, this category contains a lot of features uh, that deliver value almost semi-autonomously for, for the customer. So that is that they require sort of little customer inputs uh, for the customer to receive value. And so things like auto-saving services, rewards, or utility switching services uh, fit in here. Uh, lending and credits, I guess, is reasonably obvious, and, and as is payments uh, as well. Uh, and there are a number of different uh, innovations in, in both of those areas. Now, in terms of what this means for uh, the industry as from a, a bank perspective, um, I guess uh, you've been involved in conversations where um, uh, some of the perspectives coming back, I mean, well, does this really matter for us? You know, these are small providers. Are they actually going to um, cause much of a competitive challenge? Uh, and there's some of these conversations that go back to a couple of years. Um, but our message is a clear one here, and, and I think uh, ultimately pretty much each of these propositions, uh, challenges an existing bank uh, revenue pool. And so clearly uh, deposits and investments uh, are an important source of revenue for banking, as is lending, as is payments. And uh, you can break up those 15 propositions and drop them into a number of, uh, of baskets there, which, which highlight, I think, uh, one of the main challenges to the industry, which is that the, um, the, the challenge from open banking and, and the competition that comes from TPP ecosystem uh, won't fall in a single place, it will fall across uh, a, a number of product areas, a number of customer segments, and within that, some quite niche customer segments. And I think that's where uh, the real spur, I think, as we've you know, heard from uh, speakers all over the last two days, uh, is where the real spur for forming partnerships and um, those kind of relationships, I think, will come in the future. And just some final thoughts in the interest of time. And again, these are some of the conclusions that it's uh, uh, you know, we like to draw um, from, from this analysis. I mean, the first, I think, and again, um, you know, reinforced entirely by the, the, the uh, uh, thoughts and perspectives shared over the last couple of days is that open banking, um, you know, it's uh, not fizzling out. It's not going anywhere soon. And we're uh, maybe approaching the end of the beginning and uh, certainly uh, nowhere near talking about the beginning of the end, uh, and particularly when we think about the impact of open finance and embedded finance beyond that. Um, again, our advice to banks, you know, there is still time to act. Uh, the window is closing, uh, not very quickly, but the window is closing. And I think, um, again, as we've heard from some of the speakers, uh, it's becoming more and more important to have a, a credible and uh, proactive response when it comes to open banking strategy. 
And the third area, just bringing this back to uh, the, the uh, uh, sort of in, uh, events beyond the, the shores of the conference, I think uh, COVID-19 and the impact that has had and will have, I think, in the future uh, is likely to uh, increase demand and the need for some of the TPP services that are available on the market today. And I think, again, this, this certainly points to uh, a need for greater urgency and attention by, by the industry. Okay, so um, with that, I think um, time for some questions. Uh, maybe I'll hand back to you for, for that. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you very much. Wow, that was quite a, a compelling and complete overview. Uh, we have a question from from Vlad Vladimir. Of the five of the of sorry of the fifteen product propositions, which one do you think have the highest potential to add value and provide high margins? Gosh, that's quite a question. Um, well, I think it depends entirely on the perspective, I suppose, because um, you, I think with with the work we've done, it's quite clear that um, I think. The, the question comes down to, of course, how you can deliver value to customers and solve customer problems. I think where we're going to see traction in the the short term will be, I think, certainly around budgeting tools and um, propositions geared around uh, supporting customers through you know, potentially difficult times uh, from a financial perspective. Um, now, are those necessarily killer applications from a revenue point of view? Probably not. I think that the trick is, of course, for any provider, how you can um, – uh, layer in services beyond uh, those tools to to take financial management into a, the next level of uh, product and service delivery. So difficult to talk about margins, I suppose, but certainly where I think we'll see some interesting models um, coming in around um, uh, particular lending, broking, and improving services there, but also um, some interesting areas around um, sort of other areas of a customer's life, particularly looking at. Um, switching providers for broadband, uh, other household utilities and, and insurance and those kind of things. So I think there's certainly opportunities there for providers to um, to, to leverage you know, strong relationships with customers uh, to, to drive revenues and, and high margin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have another question. Are you familiar with, uh, you know, uh, you, you may, uh, it may sound weird, but the Swiss cheese called Emmental? Yes. Right? Yeah, so really great cheese. But actually, Emmental, as we, there is a there is a, a saying that say the bigger the Emmental, the bigger the holes. And so the bigger the holes, the less the Emmental it is. So the bigger the cheese it is, you know, the less cheese th there is, right? You know, so that's kind of a, you know, for for the joke. But it seems that yeah, it seems the market is going bigger thanks to open banking, open finance, and so we have more and more niche that also are bigger, right? That uh, big companies cannot address because they're they think the market too widely and they're not addressed they're able to address all the niche. This is why uh, fintech and TPPs are actually going, you know, to take over this niche. But again, as the saying, the more cheese, the more holes. The more holes, the less cheese, right? So yeah, how do you see like the the where do you see the e equilibrium and the balance between you know like the the value uh, uh, the, the the value capture between the two? That's a very interesting question. And I think, um, yeah, well, I suppose we've been talking in the banking industry around sort of customer targeting, personalization of services and things for a long time. Uh, but I think it's only really when you look at what's happening in the, the fintech space that you see what that means in practice. Um, and so particularly, I think, where, where there is a threat or a challenge or indeed an opportunity for partnerships for financial institutions is where they, they look to, to work with or emulate services that directly target a narrow niche. Um, and look to address the, uh, the needs of a specific segment or in a particular product area, because that, I think, is where the opportunity lies. And I've seen some quite interesting things, so propositions for uh, landlords or you know, um, small business owners that have you know, property assets, so uh, niche services for, uh, for that customer base. Uh, likewise, propositions aimed at helping um, uh, so, uh, young people who want to buy their first home to, to improve how they, they save and attach small changes in their spending activities to uh, you know, reduce the time it will take to save their deposits for a property. So um, I think, again, some very good examples around how uh, tailoring products to specific needs, a specific pain point of a customer in a particular moment, I think, is where ultimately, I guess, the nature of embedded finance is going to end up going.
So I, I've lost the audio. Can you still hear me? So is, is your mic on, Media? I'm afraid I can't hear you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I try again. There is maybe a lie. Which, by your opinion, is the main reason for the delay of the banks to apply EPI ecosystems? Oh, well, it depends who you ask, isn't it? I think um, there are uh, a lot of... Um, well, I think, to be honest with you, I think part of the, the challenge around uh, PSD2 is the nature of it was it was a regulatory mandate. And so uh, with any bank, you know, the, the conversation begins from a place of compliance, doesn't it? And certainly I remember... Uh, even four or five years ago, going to industry forums and talking to, to banks there and the, the response around PSD2, as it was then, was, well, obviously we're banks, we have a responsibility to be compliant, we will be compliant, and end of story. Um, and I guess partly for that reason, um, the, the broader strategic picture and vision, I think, has, has uh, been applied uh, differently in different organisations and, and at different speed. It's almost the fact that open banking in Europe uh, came from a, a regulatory imperative. It has been a perversely why it has catalyzed the ecosystem. Also, I think it has restricted some of what has happened since. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kieran. Uh, thank you for these insights. Again, you can share in the chat uh, some links to know more about Celant and about what you do and how to engage with you. Uh, really, it was really insightful. Uh, I invite you uh, to to uh, um, um, to stop sharing your your screen and video, so uh, and leave the stage for the next speaker. But uh, thank you for being part of EPIA's community.